Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I, uh, and thank you for staying here. This is the last lecture of three days of lectures. Uh, and uh, I totally agree with the previous uh, lecture with Dr. Um, and see why in talking about the, the most important beverage that we can have is water. Water, we have to teach our kids and teach our students and everybody around us to drink water. We're not drinking enough water. Okay, so unfortunately I don't have anything to disclose. Uh, we're going to divide this lecture in three main sections. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about hypertension, uh, also on renal replacement therapy and uh, about uh, awareness of our kidney disease. So. We're focused in hypertension, in mild hypertension, which is the one that we are encountered in the majority of time. And uh, uh, it, we have some expectations for uh, uh, 2025. Uh, at this moment, uh, the last data from 2015 shows that uh, still we have uh, a large amount of uh, uh, People with hypertension around the world is over 1 billion in 2010. 24% of the males have hypertension and 20% of females have hypertension. And it also has increased the incidence by 90% in the last four decades because we're aging, uh, because we have better ways of measuring uh, the blood pressure um, and uh, uh, we have uh, an enormous population growth as well. Now, by 2025, the World Health Organization is aiming to decrease by 25% of the total population to take them to a blood pressure less than 140 over 90. And I think that we're going to be able to reach that goal with the new guidelines. Also, we, we're eating too much salt you know, because we are preserving everything with salt. So the amount of salt that we are having every day is, is too much. So we have to decrease the amount of salt intake that we have by 30%, ideally by that time. And also, we need to move more. Uh, everybody, as the previous speaker was saying, uh, we are realizing that we are not moving too much. We need to walk more, use less the car, and, and do a little bit more exercise. So. There are some curiosities here. People that eat more potatoes, they tend to have higher blood pressure. So it's, it is associated because of the amount of starch that we are eating at that point and the uh, association between the use of salt and potatoes. Also, there is um, a small correlation uh, between, between these two factors, the par hyperparathyroidism in African descent also increases the incidence of uh, hypertension. We don't measure hyperparathyroid hormone on every uh, African uh, descent patient, but uh, we probably have to think about uh, looking into that option if, if it's the case. Uh, sometimes we have these multivitamins and all these uh, supplements that, we, uh, uh, that the marketing is trying always to sell us, and, and many times we eat a higher dose of zinc that we uh, need, especially sometimes it's prescribed for wound healing and that is associated with higher levels of blood pressure. Also, people that have urolithiasis, they tend to have uh, higher blood pressure as well. The other uh, factors that are associated with hypertension is a short stature. So the, the smaller we are, we tend to have higher blood pressure, but then the lifestyle changes will affect uh, better uh, this, this, uh, the incidence of uh, hypertension in this type of uh, population. So uh, looking into that, I was curious to see how much was the blood pressure in a giraffe. So the, the, it happens that the ventricle of the giraffe generates like 260 millimeters of mercury of systolics, and the diastolic is around 160. So, and uh, when the giraffe uh, uh, bends uh, down to drink water, uh, the, all the carotid arteries, they have multiple valves that will regulate that pressure in different stages. So when the giraffe lifts up his, uh, the head, uh, they wouldn't have a syncope. 
So, <laughs> and, uh, and, and also I was curious to see how much was the blood pressure of a cat and a dog. So it, it, the, the, it, we handled the same blood pressure, more or less systolics of 120. Uh, so we know that uh, one of the most uh, common causes of uh, uncontrolled hypertension is non-compliance. And all these measurements and all these uh, changes in attitudes that we have with the, our patients, like observing the pill taking, uh, the pill box, the, uh, insisting on the patient education, and the, the text messaging sometimes as reminders of uh, taking their blood pressure medications, actually they are not very helpful. Uh, there has been studies to see which is, would be the best way, and then it seems that a multifaceted pharmacist intervention, these typical pharmacists that are, that are calling the patient, that are calling the physician, refilling the medication, making sure that the patient refill the medication, that is taking the appropriate dose of the medication, it seems that this is the way that we have to integrate our care, involving the, the pharmacist in, in the care of, of, uh, of our blood pressure. Also, uh, the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics is not going to be very happy of, of what, what, what I'm going to say, but the cell phone has become indispensable in our healthcare. We have to use the cell phone. It's a tool that we have in our hands that has a lot of uh, uh, characteristics that we can focus our medicine care into uh, self uh, care. Uh, the, as diabetics, they take their blood sugars four times a day and they record uh, all the, the same thing has to happen with the blood pressure. So we have different applications that we can use and we can dedicate five, ten minutes in the office to ask the patient, okay, what cell phone do you have? Pull out your cell phone. You have an, an Android system or do you have a, uh, an, an iPhone? And depending on the type of uh, phone that they have, we have several applications that can be helpful for them to follow up their blood pressure. It's like a game, actually. Uh, so what they do is that they measure their blood pressure at home. And remember, always the cuff has to be in the arm, not in the forearm. The forearm cuffs are, are not very accurate. It has to be the arm. The studies are done with the cuffs in the arm. So they push the button in the automated machine they obtain a number and they record this uh, on the cell phone using these applications which are free. And the good thing of this is that they are conscious, self-aware that of how much is their blood pressure. The other thing is that they can email us those records and then uh, we can see them or somebody dedicated for the hypertension clinic can see them, call the patient back and say, hey, change the dose change the time, let's add this, potentiate this, or let's do, ask about different things. So uh, let's, let's start educating our patients about how to use their cell phone. Uh, and now many, we can't live with our cell phone. Uh, so this is one of the things that we can, we can do. Many, many of our patients uh, have uh, uh, hydrochloric acid as, as, a, as, one, as part of their treatment. And this is thanks to the Joint National Commission uh, 3, in which uh, several years ago they insisted in, in that a thiazide diuretic should be the, the main uh, starting point of blood pressure control. And then they stick with that uh, for, uh, for decades. So now we have learned that hydrochloric acid is a very good antihypertensive, but there is one that is a little bit better and actually is as, as uh, available as the hydrochlorothacide, which is chlorthalidone. So chlorthalidone is uh, a, 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 a diuretic, it's a thiazide diuretic, which half-life is much longer. It covers the 24 hours. Hydrochlorothacide, it, it only covers like a, eight to 10 hours of its uh, antihypertensive effect, while chlorthalidone, it covers 24 hours, so the, it's, uh, the cost is the same. So indapamide and chlorthalidone are these options that I'm insisting uh, that we uh, can uh, use as alternative uh, to hydrochlorothacide. Also, we know that uh, uh, adding uh, in advanced kidney disease, uh, thiazide diuretics it, it stop being a myth. Uh, we can have patients with an estimated GFR of 20 still on diuretics because, and sometimes it's going to be more 
useful because the blood pressure generation can be secondary to uh, volume. So uh, adding loop diuretics uh, like furosemide or uh, potentiating uh, the uh, uh, thiazide diuretics with loop diuretics can also uh, help us for better volume control. One of the messages that I want to leave is that edema is always abnormal. We should not have edema. Our patients should not have edema. Edema, sometimes we say, no, but it's, I'm taking amlodipine. Edema is a side effect of uh, amlodipine. No, edema, amlodipine is a vasodilator that will facilitate the edema if we have an increase in the hydrostatic pressures given by salt. So edema is never normal, and we have to make sure that the patient is always uh, eubulemic. Now, uh, systolic blood pressure, uh, we have to be careful in the hospital. When the patients uh, are admitted to the hospital and we're taking care of uh, patients in the hospital, we have to uh, let the nurse, uh, the bedside nurse, know how, how to evaluate the patient when the patient presents with uh, high levels of blood pressure. We have to make sure that the pain is controlled, that uh, the patient is not having a rebound of certain medications of as clonidine or beta blockers, or the patient is receiving excessive amount of IV fluids. I did a cross study in the hospital uh, like three years ago in which uh, we saw that 90% of the patients that were in the hospital didn't need it, IV fluids. Everybody that comes into the hospital has normal saline. There's no clear reason for, to, for us to give. Every bag of normal saline has like nine grams of, soda, of, of salt. And then we are putting the patient on a low salt diet. So it doesn't make sense. So we have to make sure that the patient only receives IV fluids when the patient is volume depleted or dehydrated. So otherwise, uh, sometimes that case manager will tell us, well, why is the patient in the hospital? The patient doesn't even have IV fluids. IV fluids are their, their medications and we have to make caref be careful of how to use them. Anxiety, nobody likes to go into the hospital. Nobody sleeps in the hospital. The nurse is coming in to blood check the, the vitals every hour, every two hours. Who, nobody can sleep. So all these factors will change the blood pressure. And please do not use hydralazine IV. It's a very potent vasodilator that produces uh, a very short acting uh, effect with severe hypotension that sometimes is difficult to, to resolve. Okay, now uh, within time, as we can see, there are several, there has, there has been multiple changes in the way that we treat hypertension. The guidelines, they go all over the places. We used to have the Joint National Commission uh, that, can, that was telling us about the guidelines. Uh, one, two, three, four, the latest one was the eighth. And uh, with the, we used to have the reports and then okay, we're going to follow these reports with this uh, medication as a starting ideally for the blood pressure control, and then adding this set of medications to see what is uh, the, the, the potentiated effect to these other ones. And uh, then Cochrane came along to, uh, giving us another uh, recommendation. And then the uh, SPRINT study came along 2015, telling us, okay, no, the Joint National Commission cannot tell everybody that systolics uh, blood pressures above uh, 150 for uh, people older than 60 years old were okay. So it became like a, a, a mixture of information uh, in these past years of how do we really have to treat the blood pressure, the hypertension, until it got to the point in which, okay, let's uh, unify all these uh, concepts uh, between the uh, Eighth uh, Joint National Commission, the guidelines of uh, SPRINT, the Canadian uh, Hypertension Educational Program, the American Heart Association, the American College of Physicians, the American Society of Hypertension, and the American Association of Family Practice. Uh, for example, the Canadian said uh, that, okay, the blood pressure uh, should be measured in the office, but not by the provider. The provider has to go 
uh, somewhere else uh, because the blood pressure changes while the provider is there. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, as we were talking about, the New England Journal published in 2015 this study in which demonstrated in a very well done multicenter randomized controlled uh, study uh, that intensive uh, therapy for uh, blood pressure control was the way to go because it decreased uh, in a significant, uh, in, in a statistically significant way, the mortality when the blood pressure was around 120 of systolic over 80 of diastolic for everybody. So the belief that we had before about having the systolic blood pressures higher in elderly changed. Right now, what we have to do is to maintain the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure as close to 120 hmm, and the diastolics as close to 80 as possible in anybody. So there was a caveat on this study in which this has been reevaluated. This was the machine that was used uh, for all the, uh, the, the study. It was an Omron machine and uh, it seemed that this machine had for the systolic blood pressure measurement a difference of 10 millimeters of mercury. So that means that in reality, it seems that the blood pressure ideal is not 120, the systolic is around 130. So what now after Sprint in 2015 and uh, 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 joint national commission in 2014, the American Heart Association got together all these recommendations and they build up these, uh, these uh, recommendations. The, blood, the ideal blood pressure should be lower than 130 over 80. So uh, this will tell us about that we have to be careful with uh, the same, the white coat hypertension, the masked hypertension, uh, and we can use the home blood pressure monitoring much more than we are, what we have to do, what we did before. Also, we have to uh, bring the availability of the ambulatory blood pressure uh, machine, which is a halter. It's a halter, a blood pressure monitor uh, for masked uh, hypertension and for white coat uh, syndrome. Now, whenever we have a patient with hypertension, we just have to assume that this patient has a new onset hypertension. If we didn't know the patient from before, let's treat it as a new onset hypertension. So we still have to look for secondary causes of hypertension. Uh, if the blood pressure is uh, 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 not controlled with lifestyle changes. So this survey of uh, for pheochromocytoma, Cushing's hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, aorta cortation, they're rare. They're rare. So the incidence is so low that the recommendation is not to go to measure substances to, to assess this. Uh, we can have a Doppler of the renal arteries. Um, we can also measure the renin-aldosterone uh, uh, levels and build up a ratio. Uh, you know, pulmonary hypertension and uh, obstructive sleep apnea also has a very high incidence of hypertension. So we have to look for that. And uh, of course, uh, drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, they have to be surveyed. Now, again, the lifestyle is very, very important, as, as Dr. Uh, Nzwani did, uh, said. Uh, I think that is, that, that is the, 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 the biggest disease that we have right now, is the, is the bad lifestyle that, that we are, that our population is, is trending to. Uh, we have to go back and revisit this uh, main things of maintaining our healthy weight, decreases the amount of salt that we have, increasing the level of exercise, and being happy. Happy will drive us all these other uh, things that, that, that can help us. Uh, we still consider that uh, stage one hypertension with the systolic higher than 140, and stage two, um, I'm, I'm sorry, stage one with the uh, diastolic uh, between 80 and 81, and, uh, and 89, and stage two, 2 with the systolic greater than 140 and diastolic greater than 90. Uh, we 
are not going back to uh, learn the Kolotov so sounds. Uh, it seems that the way that we have to uh, educate our patients uh, and uh, in our offices of how to measure the blood pressure has to be automated. Uh, we have to ask our administrators uh, to have the availability of an automated machine to measure the blood pressure. Uh, and if we have any question around that, then we can always go to the spinonometer manometer with our stethoscope and look for uh, our sounds. But the best way is to standardize a way to measure our blood pressure in the offices. And uh, uh, there's a specific instructions of the American uh, Heart Association of how to measure the blood pressure. And it, these are going to be available on the slides that we're, you're going to receive. Uh, th there's ways that we can uh, standardize the way, the appropriate way of measuring the blood pressure in, in the office. Uh, and and uh, so the key points is that the blood pressure target is, has to be lower than a third, one, 130 over 80 in most of the patients that we care for. Uh, uh, the guidelines are a synthesis of the uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, but sometimes, we, if we individualize these trials, they differ uh, multiply. So let's go to the uh, American Heart Association guidelines. Uh, it is very important to have a standardized way of measuring the blood pressure. Uh, the home blood pressure, the self-care centered care of our patient is very, very important. Uh, avoid diastolics less than 60. Hypotension is as bad as hypertension. So that the diastolics below 60, they, they, we know that it, they produce hypoperfusion of the tissues. Proteinuria, very important to, to uh, know how to measure it and how to work around it. And lower uh, blood pressure targets in very advanced kidney disease can cause lower kidney function. The kidney needs some, some pressure. It is important to have uh, an, uh, an ideal blood pressure when we have advanced kidney disease, stage four or five of kidney disease, not on dialysis. Now there are these dummies that are available in online, which uh, we can give the patient in Spanish and English in multiple languages that we can tell the patients, hey, take this, read this, and please measure your blood pressure following these uh, recommendations at home. Now let's touch a, a little bit of uh, Mm, of this topic of orthostatic hypotension, which is becoming more prevalent given the diabetic dysautonomy and the high incidence of diabetes, diabetes that we have. We have available multiple pressors, PO pressors uh, medications. <coughs> one is midodrine, and the other one is uh, this, the droxidopa, which uh, these are precursors of norepinephrine. The starting dose of this medication could be 100 milligrams TID, and up to 600 uh, milligrams TID. They have low effect in supine hypertension. And sometimes we are very concerned about the supine hypertension, but it, the studies have not shown a greater incidence of problems with supine hypertension. It, that's very important. Um, the same with midodrine. So uh, they, they decrease the symptoms and uh, obviously they need uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for titration. So what I usually tell my patient is that, okay, so um, half an hour before you, you're planning to get out of the bed and start your daily work, start taking the medication so, uh, and then do a stepwise incorporation so that they don't fall. Uh, this is becoming much more prevalent orthostatic hypotension because of diabetic dysautonomy. So we have to make sure, and here in Loma Linda, in uh, the rehab center, they're doing studies with compressions, abdominal compression and compression stockings, and it's, it has been working. We don't have all the results yet. Now, a little bit on denervation, kidney denervation. So it happens that because of all these resources that we have, we're still not able to control appropriately severe stages of hypertension. So uh, some, some of the methods that we've been looking at is doing kidney denervation. So they go in, uh, with uh, a catheter uh, and uh, uh, they go into the renal arteries 
and they burn the nerves around the renal arteries. And that uh, seems that at the beginning it controlled mildly the blood pressure, but then the studies came back like this, the simplicity hypertension study showing that no, it didn't help. So the, uh, uh, there was no significant uh, difference uh, between the study group and the intervention group. So then, uh, two months ago, this uh, circulation study uh, came up with a radio sound, which is another method of doing renal denervation. Uh, basically, we have three types of methods of doing this. One is radio frequency ablation. The other one is radio frequency ablation of the main arteries and all the other branches. And the third one is the ultrasound ablation. It seems that the ultrasound ablation uh, can help a little bit more than the previous methods that were used to control this uh, uh, severe hypertension. But uh, the, the, the study is recent. It, has, we, there, it hasn't had enough time for the population to be followed up, but it seems that uh, this uh, can help uh, on, on treating these difficult to treat uh, hypertension patients. Okay, now let's uh, switch a little bit uh, gears and let's talk about dialysis. Uh, now, this is uh, Dr. Kolb. Dr. Kolb was, is a, was a Dutch uh, doctor. He invent, invented the dialysis machine. Initially, the dialysis machine was as big as, as this table. It was a drum and that was covered with a cellulose membrane. And then the patient had uh, the blood infused into, infused into that uh, drum and then uh, a dialysate at the other side of the membrane, and then the drum moved, and then that produced diffusion and cleaning, and the patient survived. So uh, the, patient, the first patients were starting to be dialyzed. The, the invention was around 1943, uh, but the first patients were uh, more or less around one, uh, 1948 after the war. Uh, so then, Dr. Scribner, he was the one that was able to allow the patient to go home on dialysis with the shunt. So uh, the axis was a, a big problem, continues to be a big problem, but this in, uh, in the very early uh, 60s, uh, there was uh, where uh, the shunt was created and that allowed the patient to go home on dialysis. This was in Washington. And now since then, dialysis has been passing through multiple types of uh, legislation. It was in 1972 that Medicare allowed uh, dialysis to be provided uh, to uh, the patient. And since, uh, we have been having some advances on dialysis treatments. Nowadays, we have multiple machines for dialysis. We can even do home hemodialysis. So these are uh, the, uh, the, the main uh, machines we have uh, this is the machine that we use for our intermittent hemodialysis. This is a Fresenius machine. There are two companies in the world that handled dialysis, the dialysis business. One is the Vita. You, when you drive on the car on the freeway, you see this, these big uh, banners that say, we take care of your kidney disease, the Vita. Hmm? Before, it was like a secret. Like 10 years ago, it was like, hmm. Nobody talks about kidney disease. The dialysis patients enter through the back door. It was a building that nobody knew what was it. Now it's a full business. It's, the Vita is the biggest company in the United States. Now, and the biggest company in the world is Fresenius. So uh, Fresenius builds this uh, machine, uh, which is the machine that we have in the hospital, and is the main machine for uh, is, uh, is the Rolls Royce of dialysis. And it works every day, 20, 22 hours a day. Uh, we, in our hospital, we do more than 8,000 hemodialysis per year. Now, uh, we also have uh, the uh, Prisma Flex machine. This is a Baxter machine, and this is uh, for other modalities of, of continuous renal replacement therapies. Um, these uh, machines are going to be available uh, in uh, one month in our hospitals. They're, they're going to create another option for our uh, very, very sick patients in the uh, intensive care units. And we have these, uh, the other machine, uh, which is for home hemodialysis 
This is the next stage machine. This is a portable machine. Uh, the patient can take this uh, uh, and travel with the machine. It's a, for home hemodialysis. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like this big, uh, very convenient uh, for, uh, for, the, for home treatments. This is a, how a dialysis unit looks like. Uh, generally, they, they, they go between 15 and 40 stations uh, with three shifts a day. Every shift is like four hours, uh, three to four shifts a day. And uh, this is a dialysis machine in Korea uh, in which there are beds. The machines are brown. Uh, the brand is brown. And uh, uh, they, they do more intensive dialysis. They do more uh, longer dialysis. The survival rates are a little bit better. Uh, more expensive, though. And this is for peritoneal dialysis. The, the, the machines, the peritoneal dialysis machines have also evolved uh, more. These are just computers that talk to the patient and record the data from the patient from the fluids that are in and out, the dwell times, the ultrafiltration rates, and they send remotely uh, through the uh, through the internet, the information to the dialysis nurse that can tell the patient, hey, uh, switch this for that or change the time of this or can program the machine remotely. Um, so the, the concept of dialysis is the same. It's just diffusion. It's just passing uh, a concentration of uh, solutes through a membrane from a space with high concentration to low concentration. It, has, it hasn't changed since Dr. Kolf did it, the, the big uh, uh, drum uh, machine. is is the, is the same. Uh, but the number of patients that have been on dialysis is constantly increasing. Uh, also, uh, the number of transplants that we have available, it continues to be the same. So we're running into problems because all these uh, incidents of uh, uh, chronic diseases, the population aging, uh, there we are having many, many more end-stage renal disease patients that will require dialysis. And uh, the amount of the projections are not very good at all. Uh, we, we will have in the future many, many more dialysis patients that is going to represent a lot of cost for the healthcare system. Uh, the, the mortality is going to increase because of the lack of availability of uh, transplants. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the end-stage renal disease incidence rate is projected to rise between 11 to 18 uh, percent in, in 2030, and the prevalence uh, is projected to over a million in the, seven, in, the, in the same period of time. There are too many, too many patients that are going to require hemodialysis. So um, basically, the, uh, the type, the, the amount of spending that we have uh, in billions of dollars is enormously big. So what are we going to do about it? So we need to first increase the pool of uh, patients that are um, uh, recipients and also donors uh, as, as well. And the other thing is that we need to look for other ways of providing dialysis. Uh, so in, uh, in transplant medicine, we have to make sure that the patients are um, healthy enough to receive uh, a kidney transplant. But there's a problem that there are so many that the waiting time for to receive a, a disease uh, donor kidney transplant in our institution and all Southern California is 10 years. So that means that at the time that if I go into end stage renal disease on dialysis, from the moment that I start dialysis or the first time that I've seen by the transplant nephrologist, I have to wait 10 years for a disease donor if I'm, if I'm uh, o, uh, o positive. So it's too long. The patients, they don't survive that. So uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, females with pregnancies or many, many times we have a lot of need for blood transfusion. Our immunologic risk increases and increases. So we, we become 
uh, uh, we, we react to every type of serum that is available. So if there's a kidney available, we may not be compatible with that kidney. Uh, so the sensitization programs are increasing in our population. We are uh, stimulating uh, the, re the general population to donate the kidney. And, and also we are doing ABO incompatible kidney transplants. In our institution, we have done approximately 20 ABO incompatible uh, kidney transplants. So uh, we have peritoneal dialysis in which we have the 10 cuff uh, catheter uh, uh, in the abdomen uh, and uh, uh, the fistula also. Uh, as, a, as we talked before, access is, has become a problem. So we have to uh, look for other alternatives to see how can we do renal replacement therapy in our, in our patients. So here is what it seems that we're going to go through into the artificial kidneys. So there are a lot of uh, marketing around this and a lot of the CNN, like two years ago, brought up a very big news about the artificial uh, kidneys, that it was going to be the solution for all the uh, renal replacement therapies uh, that was needed at this moment. We need to be careful with and a little bit skeptic with that information. At this moment, there are three main projects that are being developed for uh, artificial kidneys. One is the WOC, which is the wearable artificial kidney. The other one is the IAC, which is the implantable artificial clinic. And the other one is the AWOC, which is the automated wearable artificial kidney. So they have uh, they increase uh, the portability, of course. Uh, the patients uh, that are less mobile, that for example, that they cannot go to a dialysis center uh, or that they have complications that are not candidates for peritoneal dialysis, they can benefit for that. And also the healthcare cost can decrease in a very important way if we are able to get to this point of having an artificial organ replaced uh, ambulatory. In ambulatory, there are multiple barriers for that. The main, bar the main barriers are the size, because every filter it needs surface area for the exchange. So the size is, is, is a problem. The other problem is water. There has to be a substance that exchanges the solutes and the solvents. So water is another problem. And the other thing, uh, the other main problem is power. It needs a battery. So how are we going to power these devices? Anyway, so the first one and the uh, one that has been uh, kind of the most successful one is this one, the AWOC, the Automated Wearable Artificial Kidney. So it happens that it is a device that is like this big hmm, that uses the peritoneal dialysis catheter. It's a peritoneal dialysis. It's a portable peritoneal dialysis. But the most interesting thing is that this device uses a water uh, filter. And, uh, it, uh, uh, and the technology has, uh, um, has uh, produced a way in which the water that is obtained from the peritoneal cavity goes into a compartment that, is ex that, the, that those solutes that are uh, there are exchangeable. Uh, and then that water get, gets cleaned and goes back into the abdomen and does this five or seven times within a period of time of 10 hours. So this is a device that uh, people are going to be able to carry around. It is not available yet. It's still in phase two but it seems that this is the one that is getting a little bit more and more advantage of, of a wearable uh, kidney. The other one is the, the WOC, which is the wearable artificial kidney, which is being developed here at UCLA. And it's basically a vest hmm, or a belt also, which has all these components. It has a dialyzer. This is the dialyzer and it has the dialysis uh, regenerated uh, pumps here 
in which this uh, cleaning of uh, the, the fluid that is obtained by, and this is hemodialysis. So the patient has an axis. So it, uh, the patient puts the needle inside the axis, and the needle comes to, the, to where the belt is, and, uh, and it, this, this occurs. So uh, the, the blood comes here, gets to, there's a bunch of pumps here that will improve the flow through, um, through the belt, and then uh, they, they will go to the filter, and that filter is washed by this water that is regenerated here with these cartridges, with another pump here, and this uh, is, is, is how it goes. So basically, this is how it look li looks like. And, and you can see them also in vests. So patients will walk around with these uh, devices. And uh, they're going to be batteries also heavy, not very comfortable. This, this goes more or less uh, six to eight hours. Yes. And then this is the one that headed the news on CNN, the uh, IAC, which is the implantable artificial kidney. Uh, which is developed at, at UCSF. And uh, what happens is that they are building these semipermeable membranes, synthetic semipermeable membranes, and they are covering these membranes with proximal tubule cells. So they are growing the cells on the lab, and they are uh, making the environment as uh, viable as possible to these cells. So they cover these every tubule with these cells that are able to interchange uh, the, uh, all the uh, substances. So uh, they basically, what they do is that the surgeon goes and um, opens here a pocket in the iliac uh, area, and they hook, it hooks uh, the, the device into the iliac artery, into the iliac vein, and uh, uh, the, this device doesn't need any energy. It's just uh, with the blood flow. Uh, but they have been having several uh, problems because of the biocompatibility and uh, because of the clotting. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, uh, it, it looks like this. So uh, we have to be, uh, this, this is in a very early stage. So IWOC is, is just uh, still being used in animal models. We haven't had the advanced, the human. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the walk, uh, which is uh, uh, the device with peritoneal dialysis, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the, uh, the AWAC, uh, which is the, the device with uh, the peritoneal dialysis, is already trialed in humans. And the walk is uh, FDA uh, approved also. Um, two kilograms for the AWAC five kilograms for the WAC, and 500 grams for the IAC. <coughs> so there are devices that are there, and then we can probably uh, uh, see them in our uh, lifespan, hopefully. So there are other research in which um, in, in rats, uh, they get the kidney, and they put this, uh, the kidney rats in detergents, so they remove all the dead cells uh, from the kidney, and then they leave all the, only the collagen, uh, the, the base membrane of, of where the cells uh, uh, get attached, and then they infuse uh, cells there, and then they put this uh, uh, new organ into a viable stage, and then it populates uh, with the cells have been able to, they have been able to demonstrate growth of cells within this organ that they uh, decellularize. Very early stages of research, but uh, some, some, something is coming. Now the third portion of the talk uh, is about kidney disease awareness. Why am I interested in this? Is I think that we're losing the battle. Uh, it's like Dr. Sensiel uh, talk. Uh, she's, she's gaining the battle. I think that nephrologists were losing the battle. We are not very good on marketing our products. We're, we, we, are not, we are not very good on, 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 on giving the message away. 
uh, we see that everybody stopped smoking or they use some blocker or they are uh, exercising a little bit more, but we don't see that our patients are gaining knowledge on kidney disease. And that is the reason that we need everybody's help to bring up awareness about kidney disease. Uh, and that is why it's so important to learn how to drink water because uh, we don't know how much water we have to drink. Uh, as we age, we lose the sensation of thirst and we don't drink water. Uh, the sodas are uh, everywhere. I even see sodas on the hospital in the trays that they bring to the, that doesn't make sense. We are in a hospital. No, they, they bring the orange soda that has 52 grams of sugar. It's the highest one, it's the worst one. There's the, the, the tray with the soda. So we have to uh, uh, work a little bit more on uh, in increasing the awareness of kidney disease because the statistics, they don't look good at all. So in March 14 is the World Kidney Day. So I'm trying to uh, inundate the hospital with this sign uh, just to make sure that the people are aware that, that we have to make, uh, the, the, uh, uh, we have to take care, better care of our kidneys. Uh, as we saw in, in the previous lecture, there's some statistics about how uh, are we doing in our global health care. The prevalence of obesity is huge in our country. Uh, the prevalence of hypertension is growing everywhere. Uh, the prevalence of diabetes is also growing um, everywhere. Smoking is kind of decreasing a little bit, but still we have some areas in the world in which uh, there are heavy, heavy smokers. And uh, this is the prevalence of treated and stage renal disease. There are still many areas in the world in which uh, there are kidney disease is underserved. Now, 850 million people worldwide are now estimated to have some type of kidney disease. Uh, the chronic kidney disease causes 2.4 million deaths per year and is the sixth fastest growing cause of death. So we saw this statistic before. Uh, in the high income countries, kidney disease is there already for in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the projections for 2030 is just, just growing up, the incidence and prevalence of kidney disease. And this is the worst of all. By 2030, uh, kidney disease is going to be uh, in the project, the worldwide, is going to be 13. In 2045, is going to be number eight. And 2060 is going to be number seven. So we're losing the battle. I mean, this is what is happening. It's the only disease that is going higher at this rate. So we need to bring up our awareness and teach our patients about kidney disease and how can we take better care of our kidneys by drinking water, by having all these bad habits uh, taken away, improving our lifestyle, mm -hmm. decreasing the amount of analgesics that we take. I don't know if you have been seen in Costco. There's uh, this person that brings the cart full of supplements, big jars of supplements. Omega-3, coenzyme Q10, multivitamins, uh, and Motrin. Hmm? And, and then the jars of Motrin, they come like 600 tablets of 200 milligrams. Hmm? Uh, I, I went to a, mission, a medical mission to Cuba uh, like three years ago, and we asked for donations. Guess what was the most common donation? Motrin. So uh, we said, okay, what are we going to do with this? Okay, so let's try to distribute a little bit, not all of it. Let's see. So we, we build up some packages of certain number over there, and then we, we start distributing vitamins and the gummy bear vi vitamins and, and then Motrin. And the people were asking, so what is this in Cuba? So what is this? Uh, oh, uh, ibuprofen. Oh, no, no. No. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lip. Do you have more gummy bears? Anyway, so we have to be careful with the NSAID abuse. NSAID is very prevalent to have in our cabinets at home Motrin or naproxen. Oh, let's take one just in case I have a headache. Have you heard that? Yeah. So I'm going to do exercise. I'm going to take a Motrin so that I don't have any muscle pain. We have to be careful with that and educate our population on that. Contrast exposure. There's a lot of the uh, amount of contrast exposure that we're giving to our patients is enormous. Enormous for every problem that happens, IV contrast. Huge amount of contrast. We have to be careful with that. So there are multiple types of uh, ways that we can mm, do kidney surveillance. Uh, we have to make sure that we catch the patient in this stage, increase risk, and we are able to change many, many of these outcomes if we catch the patient on this, uh, uh, on this stage. We have to make the patient aware that somebody's taking care of them, one. Second, that their health is their responsibility, and the kidney having, statistically, having an acute kidney injury is worse than having an MI in the lifespan of a human being. Uh, there are uh, these uh, tools that we can put around in our offices about chronic kidney disease that people can read about it. Uh, and just this, this is just to finish, uh, we have to test for proteinuria. So the way that we test for proteinuria is in a spot urine sample. We send the protein levels hmm, in, the, in that spot urine sample along with creatinine levels or in the, some labs we can send the albumin level along with the, the creatinine uh, so that we can build a ratio. So that ratio can be normal, less than 30. Between 30 to 300, which is already abnormal, that's the A2, and greater than 300, which is severely increased. We have to look for proteinuria. If we have the risk factor, excuse me, my, microalbumin is the, is the name of the assay, which measures albumin. So we can use microalbumin with creatinine so that we can build a ratio. That's the albumin-creatinine ratio, okay? In a spot urine sample. We can also measure the 24-hour urine collection. But believe me, it's not very accurate. Nobody, nobody puts their urine in their refrigerator or they cheat, they cheat, they, can you help me? Can you help me fill up because I forgot, so can you? So they cheat, so believe me, there's, there's many, many stories around that. So a spot urine sample, any time of the day, is that not a problem. Obviously, please ask the patient to uh, first, avoid doing heavy exercise in 48 hours before, no fever, no chills, no trauma. Hmm? Uh, for at least 48 hours before, because if we have all this, a lot of exercise or, or have a very, very heavy protein meal, also can change a little bit of proteinuria that we have. Okay, with that uh, finished, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? We have several questions, I figured. I have a patient who has um, blood pressure, systolic's about, you know, about 140, but then the diastolic's like low, and having trouble managing that. And then her ophthalmologist said, you cannot have the diastolic less than 60. You have to stop that blood pressure medication. What should I do? So vasodilators are the ones that will work better in uh, systolic hypertension. So you can choose between calcium channel blockers Mm -hmm. uh, in which nifedipine extended release, which is not, not uh, uh, it, it is the, the best one. Do not use nifedipine short acting because they increase mortality. They increase mortality. So extended release, we have two brands. We have Adalat and we have Procardia. Uh, Procardia is a, is a little bit more stable molecule than Adalat. Uh, yes, 
it is it, it is available. No, no, just like the uh, what do you call it? Um, in the formula. <laughs> oh yes, yes. It depends on the insurance. Uh, and then many times you have to dose it twice a day. Uh, the the uh, nifedipin. Uh, Hydralazine is also a very potent vasodilator that you can use for systolic hypertension. Okay. Question in the front. Yes. Yes, sir. Two questions. One is, how is it determined how much water should be drunk? And secondly, if the effect of hydrochloric thiazide is to decrease the intravascular volume, why not just drink less to have a decreased in their vascular volume? So, good questions. So, th the first one, uh, and it is a very common question, how much water do we have to drink? There's a study, a recent study that uh, says that uh, drinking more water than the amount that we should drink doesn't bring any benefit. The problem is that we many times, we drink less water than the one that we should drink, and to find out, there's a formula. That is the body surface area. We measure our height hmm, and our weight, and we calculate our body surface area, and we multiply that by 1.2 liters. And that is, that is the amount of water that we should drink a day. So it comes out to be between 1.8 and 2 liters per day. Body surface area times 1.2. Uh, that's, that's for the second uh, question. Uh, it, it not only is, is because with the hydrochloric acid is not only uh, volume that we lose, but we lose salt, we lose sodium. So the sodium uh, will increase our intravascular volume in a very important way. The hydrostatic pressure uh, that's with the sodium it, it changes abruptly. So by losing, by producing naturesis, because the amount of salt that we eat in our diet is very high. By, by producing naturesis, our blood pressure tends to, to come down effectively. Question. Would you, say a, would, mine? Yeah. would you say a word about the efficacy of ACEs and ARBs in preventing the kidney disease in the diabetic patients? Because I've been told that diabetes is probably, if not the, at least the second leading cause of dialysis. How uh, effective yes, is it? It is. Dr. Brenner, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, the author of uh, our textbooks, uh, he did a study in 1991 uh, about using losartan, which is one of the yeah, first yeah. ARBs in diabetic yeah. populations. Yeah. And he demonstrated that by an appropriate use yeah. of yeah. ARBs and ACE inhibitors in diabetic population, dialysis can be delayed up to 10 years. So when do we use ACE and ARBs in diabetes? For the entire period of the disease. It is very important. The uh, intrarenal pressure decreases with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and that decreases proteinuria. And that effect will prolong the kidney life. It doesn't matter what stage of kidney disease. It can be stage one, two, three, four, or five, not on dialysis. But ACE and ARBs have demonstrated uh, kidney protection. Good question. Next question. Yes, does um, England have an age cutoff for dialysis? How much do we pay for dialysis Medicare in America? Uh, okay, so at this moment, anybody can be a candidate for dialysis. The thing is that we have to put in a balance what is the risk and the benefits of having dialysis. Dialysis has a very big impact in the lifestyle of a person. Hmm? Somebody can become miserable on being on dialysis for the last two months of their life. Or sometimes what produced the disease hmm, is going to kill that person faster uh, 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 than, than the dialysis treatment. My question is, does the United Kingdom have an age cut off? That I don't know. I only heard it was 66. I don't know what they do when they cut them off. Yeah. 
it's probably it, it, uh, it's, it's probably higher than that at this point. <laughs> yes. A question over to the right there. So I'm uh, curious what your thoughts are about the writing of the nephrologist Jason Fang and his uh, seeing that we're not solving the diabetes problem and, and suggesting intermittent fasting as, as one of the uh, prevention strategies? Uh, yes. Uh, there's, uh, because of, the, of this high caloric intake that we take, it seems that one of the uh, maneuvers that we have for intermittent fasting has been demonstrated to help, uh, on, especially on uh, the salt intake. Obviously, we have to be careful with the fluid intake. Uh, water is not in the equation. Water has to be, uh, and then when we fast, I personally fast one day a week. Uh, but I make sure because if I don't eat, I'm not thirsty because I don't generate the solutes to get rid of. So uh, we just have to make sure that within th those fasting periods, the in, uh, water ingestion is appropriate. And as somebody said, do whatever you need to do to lower your blood pressure and to take care of, of your kidney. If that takes only having dark chocolate, because dark chocolate has a little bit of effect of lowering, lowering the blood pressure, do it. Yes. Question in the say. back. Anyway, dark chocolate had, has a, a little bit of effect in hypertension. Yes, sir. Two questions. Can we tell patients just to check the color of the urine to know if they're drinking enough? And second question, if an elderly person is told that he's in early kidney failure and he needs to drink several liters of water a day and he drinks a liter all at once, are you worried about hyponatremia? Excellent question. So uh, we stop paying attention to the color and to the odor of the urine. Uh, when you receive a report of the urinalysis, there's no color or odor. We, we stop doing that because that depends on what we eat, basically. Now, there are extremes. For example, I had a patient that came in from jail, uh, and they uh, uh, sent him because he was completely asymptomatic at that point, but the urine was turning uh, brownish, dark brownish. And the jail people already knew that he was punished uh, by doing squats, uh, 5,000 squats, and he had ribomyelitis. So they sent him to the hospital. So uh, in those extreme points, yes, the color is one. And the other thing, the hyponatremia, uh, drinking one liter of water is not going to make a difference. Actually, if we have a healthy kidney, we have to be careful with this information. If we have a healthy kidney, we are able to drink up to three gallons of water without decreasing our sodium. But don't tell this to, your, to our patients. <laughs> Why? Because water sometimes creates an addiction. I don't know if you've had, had patients that are addicted to water. So I, I remember a patient that came into the hospital with the sodium on 102, mm. and she was feeling a little bit dizzy. So interrogating her, she had kidney stones in the past. So she was told that the only way to avoid the pain of passing a stone again or generating the formation of stone was to drink a lot of, a lot of water. She was drinking like 10 gallons of water every day. So she was intoxicated, but it took so long that she was still, you know, with it, with 102 of serum sodium. So one liter of water doesn't make a difference, but we have to be careful with the information that we give the, uh, to our patients. We have to put limits to our patients. Okay, you drink between one and a half and three liters of water, no more than that. Because people that get addicted to water, we have to be careful with that. Question here. Yes. Um, two questions. So um, pretty common um, patients will have verifiable good blood pressure, 120 over 70s at home all the time. Always comes in, though, high um, white coat, 150, 160, 170s. You know, they're like 
I don't need meds, I'm always good at home. Yes. So that's the first um, scenario. The second is um, very common um, when they come into the clinic, uh, first blood pressure is high sitting. So at our medical office, the LVNs are told to um, take another one standing. Um, I just wanted your comments on that second blood pressure okay. procedure. Okay, so nobody likes to go to the physician. I'm sorry about it, but this is true. The, believe me, the best day that somebody can have is not going into to the physician. They get into traffic, they have to get the elevator, they are running late, they have to sit in a waiting room seeing other people that are sick and, and angry and uh, I mean, it's not the most, the, the, most, the, the best uh, uh, experience. So measuring the blood pressure in the office is not the best uh, uh, evaluation that we can have. If the patient is telling us that the home blood pressure monitoring is normal, hmm, then we should rely on that information. But it means that the patient, when that means that when the patient has a little bit of anxiety, then the systolic goes to 150 in any type of intervention. So for that reason, I send this patient home with an ambulatory blood pressure machine, a holder, for 24 hours, and see in the regular life of this patient how is their blood pressure fluctuating depending on the situation. Because sometimes we find that at 7 in the morning when they just wake up, they wake up with 160. Or while they sleep, they don't dip. We normally sleep, we, we dip while we sleep. Our blood pressure decreases up to 20%. And sometimes this white coat hypertension or masked hypertension, these patients, they don't dip. So the ventricle gets a little bit thicker. So, so then they will benefit from treatment. Another question across the room. Uh, my question is about uh, the same as the last uh, uh, question. Uh, the Canadian uh, hyperpressure guidelines recommend doing home blood pressure monitoring and don't pay much attention into the office blood pressure mo monitoring by the uh, doctors. And I was wondering, because most of our patients are not just getting supplement from Costco, they're getting the blood pressure machine from Costco. So is there any studies on how accurate or reliable are those home blood pressure monitoring? Yes, good, excellent question. Uh, they are. They are accurate and they're getting better. Uh, and what we should do is we, we should ask the patient to bring their machine per, per, in a, you know, periodically and compare the, those results with the machine that we have calibrated in our offices. Uh, this, uh, this, again, make sure that the cuff is up here because the cuff in the forearm is not, is not accurate. Yes? Um, I think it's already being studied as like the first blood pressure reading from the machine are usually higher. Correct. And I believe the commercial machine, they throw out the first numbers and then uh, get an average of the other, how many? Three. Three. So but I three times those, average of those three. Those who get at Costco, I don't think they do that, do they? Yes, they do. They do? They do. Okay. They are now, they are, the machines nowadays, they're connected on Bluetooth with the phone and they send a message, say, hey, it's time to measure your blood pressure. Uh, or they send the, the message that your blood pressure is high, send the message to your, to your physician. They're getting very, very, um, they're, they're getting much better, the technology. But the patients, they don't need that. They just need, need to measure the blood pressure and log it in and bring us that, uh, that result. Now, answering the second part of your question over there about the, the, uh, the difference of blood pressure while sitting down and standing up, uh, yes, it depends because if the patient is diabetic and has this autonomy, many times these patients are uh, sitting down or laying on the bed while they measure their blood pressure. And we titrate the antihypertensive, so when the patient stands up, has orthostatic hypotension, and boom, they fall. So diabetic patients, that they have any evidence of orthostatic changes, they should always measure their blood pressure while standing up. One more question. Yes. Do you have any advice? Because I have um, 
one patient that addicted to water, yeah. and she would drink like two, three gallons a day, and yeah. her sodium is chronically low, like in the yeah. 110, 120s. Yeah. I've been telling her about this, talk about limiting sh uh, the water, any advice to help her? Yes, so uh, education, uh, and sometimes because it's an addiction, it's a problem. Uh, sometimes we have to tell them, you need to eat more salt. So you have to increase the amount of solutes mm. to, uh, to avoid the problem. Uh, and sometimes they require getting into the hospital and NPO. A a NPO, so the, the kidney will regulate itself in a matter of 24 to 48 hours very nicely without any type of intervention. And the patient will, uh, will end up drinking less water after that intervention. Let's give Dr. Infante a round of applause. Thank you, Thank you very much for this very relevant uh, information that you've shared with Thank us. You so much.